Welcome to another edition of What You Need to Know. Mike Richardson here, and today we're going to provide another opportunity to look behind the scenes and see how another organization deals with our own, our future town leaders, our children. Uh, you surely have heard of the Boys and Girls Club of Cape Cod, uh, or for sure the Boys Club or Girls Club of various towns and, and cities across the country, uh, and perhaps even in your hometown, if not Mashpee. The beginning started in 1860 in Hartford, Connecticut, by three women, Mary Goodwin, Alice Goodwin, and Elizabeth Hammersley, who believed, and rightfully so, that boys who roam the streets should have a positive alternative. Uh, so a nationwide movement followed in 1906 on the rest of this history. Some four million plus youth have been impacted, but more needs to be done. The Mashpee, uh, or the Boys and Girls Club of Cape Cod in Mashpee was incorporated as a nonprofit in April of 1995 and has become a very busy organization since that time. With special events, youth group opportunities, teen programs, after school programs, and summer camp. But rather than I trying to explain it, uh, let's hear from Ruth Provost, the executive director of our club. So Ruth, uh, welcome. And Thank to you, start, Mike. let's let Matthew know more about you. I'm sure uh, many are aware of all that you've done in town, uh, hard work for our youth, but let's let other people know something about you and how this all came about. Well, how it came about was wonderful people like you built a Boys and Girls Club and opened it in 1999. Um, I came to the organization three years after the first doors opened at a, the Kraft Family Clubhouse. Um, I've always worked with young people. I started off in high school. I was a Brownie Scout leader and a summer camp counselor okay. for years and years. So it's always been one of the things I've enjoyed doing is working with kids. Um, it's basically what I do. I spent um, many years um, on PTA. I chaired the local committee. I was the mass PTA ledge chair for the whole state, which basically meant I was their unpaid lobbyist. I served on the sandwich school committee for six years. Um, and that, that work for PTA as the lobbyist took me into the state house. I was in the state house probably, it was during ad reform, probably a couple of days a week. Uh, during that whole process and it went on and on and on and on. So I really got a taste of the bug for politics and when my term on the Sandwich School Committee was up I decided to run for state representative. Lost my first race, I served six years and uh, when I was no longer at the State House I was looking for work and I, you know I was sort of enjoying a little time off, you know, it's pretty intense. And I got a phone call from the Boys and Girls Club uh, board here in Mashpee, and they said, we're looking for an executive director. Would you be willing to come and interview? And that was 17 years ago, or give or take, I'm in my 17th year now. And um, they hired me. I wasn't quite ready to go <laughs> back to work, but it was such an appealing job. I could not turn it down, so I said yes. And, and I've been there for ever since and I love every minute of it. It's the best thing. I mean I've worked with kids directly. I've been an advocate for kids uh, but working hands-on with kids is really the best and I get to do both because we have a Mass Alliance of Boys and Girls Clubs that represents the 41 Boys and Girls Clubs here in Massachusetts and I served on their board for an, probably the last 10 years. Wow, so that's pretty impressive. Um... So the numbers of youth nationwide are large, millions of young people. Millions. Um, it seems almost unwielding, uh, but uh, as far as Mashpee is concerned, can you give us some idea of the numbers that are impacted in Mashpee? I mean, it's not all, I guess it's not all just Mashpee youth. No. Uh, but how do they get involved and how do, how do the youth in Mashpee in that area become part of the Boys and Girls Club. Well, first of all, we're the Boys and Girls Club of Cape Cod, mm -hmm. which means we serve any Cape Cod child, 6 to 18, um, here on the Cape, um, and whenever we're open for their age group. We're located in Mashpee because it's centrally located on the Upper Cape in Barnstable. We're no more than 15 or 20 minutes from the canal to the, the edge of Barnstable. Mm -hmm. So the committee that built the Boys and Girls Club originally was made up of people from all of the Upper Cape towns. And, and because of the central location, we're located here in Mashpee, which means that the Mashpee kids were right behind the Quashnet and Coombe School. Mm 
So the Mashpee kids can walk to the Boys and Girls Club. So that really makes it very convenient for Mashpee. But the reality is we are open to any, any teen, any kids 6 to 18. We actually run a teen program in addition to providing before and after school services for the younger kids. And the teen program, the teens pay for that themselves and they, a lot of them are mobile. So that's hugely popular. Our teen population, I want to say, is just under half of our total population because those kids, even during COVID, needed a place to go and something to do. And we were one of the few places where they could find it. So what, what would be a good number to throw out there in terms of the number our of Our annual children? membership, Mike, runs not during COVID, but even during COVID, serving kids online and in person, we ran close to a thousand kids. Our membership normally runs 130 to 150. Uh, I mean, a thousand, 1,030 to 1,050 kids. So you figure over the course of the last 22, 23 years, we probably, we've served literally thousands and thousands of kids. I mean, I, I wouldn't even be able to guesstimate because some of those kids stay with us for their entire 12 years of school. Some of them come and go, you know, without being able to look back, but figuring our membership and figuring how many years we've been there, literally thousands and thousands of children have walked through those doors and been impacted by the programs that we run. So ages six through 18, 18 uh, which is a sizable number of <laughs> years. Uh, and I'm not so sure this is easy to do, but uh, could you describe for us what's a, what's a typical day at the Boys and Girls Club? Well, it really depends on your age, as yeah. we talked about, but for the younger kids, and I have to stop right here and interject, we actually run two programs. We run a before and after school program during the school year, which is a drop-in program normally mm -hmm. during non-COVID times. And we run a licensed summer day camp in the summer, and that's a totally different operation. But on a school day, the kids would come in from the schools, they walk from the schools, they sign in at the front desk. Each kid has a membership card. We scan it in so we know who's there. Um, and then there are activities around academics, health and fitness, character and leadership, and they choose which activities they want. Normally there's two activities per, per age group. Mm -hmm. Now considering that that would be grades one through six. The older kids normally are at the high school and they don't show up at the clubhouse itself until uh, six o'clock when the little kids leave. So the little kids come in at three, three thirty. They stay till six. The teens are at the high school program. They're there from two until six. At six, we bring them to the clubhouse, and they come in from six to eight or ten at night. So the kids would come in. They could either go to the art room. They could go and do their homework. We have an education director who does individual tutoring for kids that need a little bit more help. Um, they can play in the games room. They can go in the gym. They can learn how to cook. Um, they can learn life skills. Um, there's always leagues going on. There's fitness challenges. We run the gamut. Anything yeah. that does deals with academics and improving academic performance, health and fitness activities. Uh, we do a focus a lot on STEM, science, math, engineering, and technology program because we really want kids to understand how the world around them works. Sometimes our kids not even sure that french fries are potatoes. You know, so <laughs> we really kind of try and it's, we, we package impact in fun. So the kids don't know that they're learning something. For example, the sports leagues, we, there's usually two sports leagues going on all the time, different ones during the year. And we put the statistics for the sports leagues on the board. So the kids are hot to trot to find out what their team's doing, what they are doing, how it all, all the numbers look. They don't realize they're doing math and statistics and we would never tell them, That's but true. they're doing it. And they're doing it pretty much daily to check what's going on with the sports leagues. Well, it sounds like a 24 hour day for you is just, uh, just a short day, uh, hours and hours and hours. So it's an impressive array of things that, that you do. Uh, clearly no rest for the weary because it sounds like an awful long time. Uh, they don't happen by accident and uh, they're, they're not free. Uh, so 
uh, and I imagine a lot of your time is spent trying to market, searching for funding and, and getting some support. Uh, and uh, two things, uh, how large a staff do you have and uh, uh, how, what can people do to provide support to what you do? We, we could not do this without a absolutely awesome staff. We have uh, six full-time employees, myself and an office manager. We do all the back. We do the marketing, the books, the finances, the fundraising, all of that kind of stuff is in the back, back office, and that's the two of us. And then my four program staff handle everything else, and we have a director who oversees the program at the club, um, and then we have, depending on the time of year, anywhere from 10 to 15 part-time staff who are there when the kids are there on site. Um, and the staff really have stepped up to the plate. During COVID, they, on a dime, they switched from serving kids in person to going totally virtual, providing one or two hours a day of live interactive Zoom programming and then creating videos that we could put up and the kids could watch at any time. And that was, that was hugely successful. And they were so anxious to get back to work. We reopened in person a year ago in the beginning of July for our first in-person uh, summer camp um, with nine kids per unit and four units. But they really, they wanted to be back. They wanted to be serving the kids in person. And they, they, I cannot say enough good about the work that they do. They've been with us for the most part for many years, the, the staff there. The part-timers come back to us uh, from high school, from college. My summer camp counselors come back year after year. Um, and some of my senior staff are, have been and will be again former club kids. Um, it takes a lot. The budget for the Boys and Girls Club is $800,000 a year. Um, which is a lot of money to raise from scratch on Cape Cod every year. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you, you know, the, yeah. it's mom and pop businesses. Everyone's struggling to make a living. Uh, somehow we managed to do it. I call it the Boys and Girls Club Miracle. Um, I'm not quite sure how it happens every year, but we do manage to do it. The kids pay a membership fee for the school year, and that's all they pay. Um, last year it was $180, so for the entire school year, it worked out to a dollar a day for school. During COVID, we did up it because we had so many fewer kids mm -hmm. uh, to $5 sure. a day. But normally it's a about a dollar a day, our membership fee, which leaves us probably costs us about 700 to $800 per kid to provide the services for them for the year. So you can imagine we have to raise that difference sure. from scratch. Sure. So we do it by uh, begging people such as yourself, um, asking for contributions to the Boys and Girls Club. We do it through special events. We have many. We actually have one coming up on June 17th. It's an annual meeting that has morphed from an inside dinner, sit down yeah. dinner, which people aren't quite comfortable with sure, yet, yeah. to an outside barbecue at the Boys and Girls Club that we will be cooking on big grills, great food, music, um, and I believe we're going to have a wine and beer tasting as part of it too. So it's going to be a wonderful event and at the club. And all of a sudden become attracted to that. It, it really <laughs> will be, yeah. It really will be fun. Um, and then we hopefully will have a fishing tournament this year um, in July. We have a golf tournament on August 30th. We should have a road race on the 30th of October, all things being equal and everything working out. And then we're really, one of the best things we do to raise money is we do a chili challenge at Papineset on the beach in the tent in January, which is a blast. And we're hoping we can redo that again this year. So it's, it's really a combination. I write a lot of grants. Um, local banks and mm -hmm. institutions have been very generous in supporting the club over the years. So we, you know, we scramble together from wherever we can. Worst comes to worst, you know, I'll go out there and go, oh, no, we need money for the kids. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, it's not hard to understand how somebody, a business, could get involved when you start hearing about all the things that you do. Uh, so uh, for those watching and uh, have an opportunity to uh, get your business involved. If they're not involved now, uh, this is Ruth Provost, and this is an opportunity for you to do so. So how do you track, um, I guess the question would be for those watching, 
how do you track success or how do you know that, that your organization has uh, worked or I guess when I say work, help, help uh, the young people go beyond uh, where they started and some of the issues they deal with. It's a very busy day, it's, a, it's an awful lot of things that you offer, but how do, do you track uh, we do. We do. We keep track of the kids' report cards. We usually take a subset of about 25 kids and we extrapolate from that. Um, we also do surveys after the after school program finishes of parents. We do after summer school finishes. And I think one of the things that I am most proud of is the way we can show impact. And I've got some numbers here for you that, that blew my mind away. Um, we always knew we had, anecdotally at least, that we were having an impact because the kids told us, the parents told us. Mm -hmm. But about eight years ago, we started surveying our kids. Um, and what we did was, it's an online survey, it's a blind survey, the kids do the survey. Um, the results go to Boys and Girls Club of America, our national organization. And they have a professional survey company take a look at the survey results and, and they clean it up the data. They throw out anybody's answers that are all B's. They throw out anything, you know, that's taken two seconds to do because right. we know they're not paying mm -hmm. attention. It's not a valid set of data. And that data comes back to us in the aggregate, total, you know, blank. We don't know what individual kids answered, but we're able to take a look at that data and it tells us that our kids, 96% of our kids expect to graduate from high school and go on to some sort of thing. Um, it tells us how we're doing everything about the club. And I think the stuff that's the most impactful, Mike, is the teen data because the, we ask separate questions of the teens along with the bigger subset of, um, they're the same questions that are asked in high schools across the country, the youth risk behavior survey questions. Um, and so we're able to compare Boys and Girls Club teens with teens who aren't in Boys and Girls Clubs using apples to apples, which is, which is big. And so for the last five or six years, we've gotten that data back. And we don't have, there's 41 clubs in Massachusetts, 37 of them have teen programs. So what we do is not enough teens in any one club answer the question to be statistically significant. Try saying that twice, statistically <laughs> significant. Sure. But what we do is we take the, all the teen answers from Massachusetts and we aggregate them. And from that we can extrapolate. And let me tell you, these numbers have not varied in the last five years. This is, this is hard data that it's been validated every single year. Uh, but what it has shown us, the Boys and Girls Club teens, 97% of Boys and Girls Club teens last year avoided binge drinking compared to 84% of teens in Massachusetts. In terms of overall drinking, 92% of Mass Boys and Girls Club teens avoided drinking versus 66% in Massachusetts. Numbers are huge. Marijuana use, 92% of Boys and Girls Club kids say they avoided marijuana use versus 76% kids said that from kids who weren't in Boys and Girls Club. Cigarette use, pretty much everybody's not smoking cigarettes right now, so 98% of our kids say they didn't smoke cigarettes versus 93% statewide. But even on vaping, which is the closest we are to what the standard is for yeah. Massachusetts, 90% of our kids say they haven't vaped 80% in Massachusetts. This is comparing apples to apples, oranges to oranges. These are the exact same questions asked of both sets of kids. Um, and so that, that's the impact we have. I think the other thing you have to look at is the number of kids we serve and who we're serving, Mike. 20, um, 27 percent of my kids live on twenty thousand dollars a year or less think about what it would be like living on twenty thousand dollars a year or less and raising a family 45 percent of my kids come from a minority background and 44 percent live in a single parent household 64 percent of my kids are eligible for free and reduced lunch so the kids that we're serving 
our kids who really need that help, their parents especially need that help because they're working to keep a roof over their kids' heads and childcare on mass in, in, here on the Cape or anywhere else is really almost the equivalent of a second mortgage for a family. So without an affordable program like ours, these kids would be going home alone. And when the club first opened, the police chief even said that juvenile crime dropped when the Boys and Girls Club opened. So the reality is we have an impact and we can measure it in many ways, but but the numbers themselves, hard data at this point, over five years, it was astounding to, for me to see these numbers the first time and to see them consistently hold true at this point. I, I'm very confident to say these are, these are valid numbers. It's, uh, it's interesting that, um, well, it's interesting that the data numbers that you have show such dramatic differences, yeah. uh, which means that uh, people watching or the residents of Ashby who don't participate or have not considered participating should seriously consider taking a look at it if they can, because it appears that you are really doing a wonderful job with, our, with the children of Ashby. And, and those children, uh, many of them will become long-term residents, participate in town management, and leadership, maybe perhaps even becoming the executive director of the Boys and Girls Club at some point in time. Uh, so I want to thank you for what you do. Uh, clearly, your your interest and involvement in youth uh, makes makes a difference. And the Boys and Girls Club, I would guess, uh, it's uh, a statement that probably uh, means a lot. They mean it means a lot to everybody in Mashpee. It means a lot to all the youth in Mashpee and. So there you have it, uh, folks. This is a, kind of a summary of the Boys and Girls Club of Cape Cod, located in Mastery, led right now uh, and for the past 17 years by Ruth Provost. Can I add one thing? Of course you can. A study by the University of Michigan a few years back showed that for every $1 just contributed to a Boys and Girls Club, there is a $9.60 return to the local economy in terms of parents being able to work, uh, kids not involved in juvenile crime, kids are behaving, kids who then go on to get a decent job and do well in, in the rest of their lives. So if people are interested in contributing, just take that dollar that you're gonna give us, multiply it by $9.60, and that's the impact it will have on the local <laughs> economy. Okay, so that's a pretty good summary. Uh, those of you out there that are interested in investing uh, in something for profit, if you, that's the way we were to put it. For every dollar, uh, the town of Mashpee and other surrounding towns uh, benefit uh, nine times. Uh, so before we, before we close, and uh, it's been an interesting conversation, should anybody wish to get involved, uh, whether they want to uh, volunteer, uh, and I participated probably not as much as I should, but I've been involved for a while, uh, how would they get involved? Who would they contact uh, so that we can let them know? Mike is too modest. He's on our board of directors, and we couldn't function without a decent board of directors and caring adults, so thank you for that. Uh, they can reach us at the Boys and Girls Club of Cape Cod. We're on Facebook. Just search Boys Girls Club of Cape Cod. They can reach us at 508-477-8845 or they can go to our website, which is www.boysgirlsclubcapecod.org. So that's it for this edition of What You Need to Know. Uh, as a reminder, uh, should you have any questions, comments, concerns, uh, please send them to info at mashpeetv.com. Uh, we want to thank Ruth Provost once again, not only for, for being here today to talk about uh, the Boys and Girls Club at Cape Cod, but for all you've done for the boys and girls of Aww. Cape Cod uh, and Mashpee, uh, it's, it's not a, uh, anything for a shrinking violet. It's a job that you have to be involved, that you have to be out in front, uh, and you've done a wonderful job. I've known you for quite a few years. So uh, one more organization that we talk about uh, that helped the youth of Mashpee and the surrounding towns. Uh, thanks for being with us, uh, and until next time, Mike Richardson, and Ruth Provost, over and out.